Hi, everyone. Welcome to the seventh episode of the Public Health Podcast. We are Clarice and Ashley from the Harker Public Health Club, and we were so happy to be joined today by Xavier Amatrian. Mr. Amatrian is currently the co-founder and CTO of Curai, a startup using AI to scale the world's best healthcare to every human being. Prior to this, he was the VP of Engineering at Quora and Research slash Engineering Director at Netflix, where he led the team building the famous Netflix recommendation algorithms. But before going into leadership positions in industry, Mr. Amatrian was a research researcher in both academia and industry. With over 50 publications in different fields, Mr. Amatrian loves sharing his extensive knowledge and we were delighted to have him do that with us today. In this episode, Mr. Amatrian discusses COVID and how machine learning and AI in healthcare have responded to the pandemic, featuring his own startup, Curai. The following is the discussion he had with us. So previously at Netflix, you worked on movie recommendations and now you work on healthcare. Do you think algorithms, especially machine learning, are now powerful enough to crack the secrets of nature's law and benefit human welfare? Um, great question and I'm very happy to be talking to you uh, about all these topics. I will say that I usually try to demystify algorithms and I think that cracking the secrets of nature is probably too much for what AI and machine learning can do nowadays. But algorithms can be extremely useful in many uh, fields of uh, mm, uh, science, including medicine. If we try to think about like, where are the places where we can automate and we can scale and we can basically use uh, data to improve our decision-making. And I think that's the key aspect of how we should think about algorithms in the case of uh, medicine in particular, right? When a doctor has to make a decision, they need to remember years of medical research and things they have studied uh, during many years of, uh, of their college studies and publications that have been published since then. And they also need to understand everything that the patient is telling them, and they need to make a decision with all that data. That is very hard to do. That honestly is like, if we didn't have computers and we were doing all the computations for uh, any kind of job by hand, right? Imagine that uh, we didn't even have calculators and we were doing all the uh, computations that we need to do for anything, an architect or an engineer by hand, uh, with pen and paper. That would be really hard. And that's pretty much what we're asking doctors to do. Algorithms can help tremendously. And you can go from very simple algorithms that are basically just checklists or decision trees to much more complicated and advanced algorithms that then use data to build sort of like more advanced uh, ways to help decision-making medicine. Now that again is very far from understanding and cracking sort of like the secrets of nature and mm, the biology and human beings as such, but still is extremely helpful, right? So I'm very, very bullish on the power of algorithms to help medicine and to help us as humans in the context of uh, medicine and even drug discovery and things like that. However, I would say I don't think we're even close to cracking nature and biology as such. Of course, yeah. Thank you for that elaborate answer. I like how you mentioned um, how much time and effort it takes for people to develop those algorithms when it comes to medicine and drugs. Um, just as a follow-up to that first question, I was reading an article by um, Michael I. Jordan, not the, not the basketball player, um, where he's, he was talking about how the AI revolution hasn't happened yet and that um, we should be focusing more on AI in healthcare and AI in medicine rather than like um, game playing AI such as in chess or Go. So would you agree with this statement in saying that there's there haven't been as many time investments in AI in healthcare? Yes, uh, I would totally agree with that. And I think we uh, we have a lot of really smart people um, working on algorithms and applications of AI and machine learning to domains that don't really matter or shouldn't matter that much, right? And game playing might be one of them 
or just algorithms for uh, trading stocks would be another one, right? And those are very advanced. And we haven't had nearly as many people thinking about uh, healthcare and about how to improve and how to use uh, AI and machine learning to move medicine and healthcare forward. I will say that in recent times that's changing and I'm glad that it is changing, but I would agree that it's, uh, it's important to put as many minds and effort in those fields that matter. And I would say healthcare, education, energy, probably those are the three top needs for humanity, right? And those are ones that deserve all our care and attention. And there's probably others that are, you know, it's fine that we have some people working on them like Netflix, right? <laughs> I was there before and it's okay to, to build a product like Netflix, but I think we really owe it to ourselves to focus on the really important problem that humanity has. Of course. And yeah, big thank you to you and Kirai for leading that movement. Um, moving on to the next question. There's a saying, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. This is especially true in the medical domain. However, despite the advent of wearable devices such as the Apple Watches and Aura Rings, there are still very few statistics we can measure directly through these devices. Um, what's your prediction of the future of wearable devices for healthcare? Yes, a great question. I think, um, as you were saying, there's a huge need for more data and data-driven decision-making in healthcare, right? And then the, the question, as you uh, well formulated, is like, how do we get that data and where do we get it from? I think wearables is a very interesting um, way to get data. I'm not exactly sure that nowadays or in, in the short term, they are going to be the solution. And the, the, the reason for that is they're still way too expensive, right? It's like, maybe we don't realize ourselves because we live here in Silicon Valley and we think everyone has an Apple Watch or can have an Apple Watch or a wearable, but there's a tremendous amount of the world population that cannot have an Apple Watch, right? And I am interested in saying, how can we help those people? And the last thing we want is for healthcare to only improve for the rich people, right? We want, we want it to get to everyone. So I would say because of that, I'm less interested or less bullish on wearables as such, but I'm really, really uh, interested in saying, how can we get, um, for example, at home testing or people to do testing and to check their blood pressure and their temperature in a digital way, uh, in a much more accessible and affordable way, right? And I think at-home testing with devices that are not even wearables, like through your phone, there's uh, a couple of startups that are doing really interesting work on how to test yourself only with the phone. You don't need any Apple Watch or any, any other uh, accessory. That for me seems much more interesting. Um, that's one, right? So the phone as a testing device. And then the other one is how can we get uh, affordable and cheap testing to either the home of the patient or to places that are nearby, like for example, pharmacies, right? Uh, pharmacies have become a place where people go and do some testing, but I think we could invest in doing much more um, accurate and much more extensive testing in pharmacies. So the people that don't have the ability to buy the device, they could go there and uh, use that as a, as a hub. So that's, uh, I think wearables will in the future be um, probably affordable enough that they could impact the majority of the, the population. But for now, I think we should focus on like, how do we make devices that are, everyone has like a phone useful for testing or how can we get people to a place nearby where they can get extensive testing so that we can use that data to make better decisions. That's a great answer. I like how you pointed out affordable technology, despite because Apple Watches and Oura Rings are definitely um, not available to the majority of the population. I had a quick follow-up actually for that question as well. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about this um, idea but of a digital twin 
Um, so in the medical contest context, it would be like a virtual representation of the human body um, yes. and where you could like study medicine and drugs, right? Um, but I think that for digital twins, I think the purpose of them in the medical context is that medication is ineffective on a large population of people with um, uh, people with like, for example, Alzheimer's or arthritis. And with these digital twins, we can specifically diagnose uh, for individuals and diagnose those optimal treatments. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And given the fact that a lot of people don't have access already to modern technology, is this something that would happen in the near future? Yeah, great question. And that's an area that I'm really interested on. It actually connects very much with my past experience in personalization at Netflix and even before that when I was a researcher, right? There's this notion of precision medicine. It's like, how can we get exactly the right treatment to the right person? How can we have an accurate representation of everyone and have uh, your digital twin um, be your representation of you as a medical entity, so to speak. I, I, I do think that's, uh, that's extremely interesting and it is something that we should push um, towards. Um, again, my biggest concern is how do we do that in a way that we don't um, make the differences, the social differences for healthcare even worse, right? So the, the last thing I would like for this to um, create is that people that have access to those digital twins and are the people that have money are the ones that get good healthcare and then everyone else doesn't. And I think that's something that we need to really keep in mind. And that's why I, I push, <laughs> and even in, in your question so much towards accessibility being a key aspect of everything we do, right? Because otherwise we run the risk of, yeah, creating really good solutions for the people who can afford them and then leave everyone else out. And that's something that we've seen that socially doesn't create the right incentives and we need to avoid. So again, uh, data, mm, personal, personalized decisions, data and representations of people uh, through their data and digital uh, mediums, I think are really, really important and really interesting. But for each of those steps, we need to wonder how do we get them to everyone, right? Not just to the few that can pay for them. Awesome, yeah. Thank you so much for your insight um, in this aspect. I definitely agree. I think healthcare should be available for everyone. And I really like that you are always working toward affordable and um, accessible solutions for everyone. So for the next question, um, I I believe by collecting, integrating, and analyzing a humongous amount of personal health data, we may accelerate medical breakthroughs and benefit humanity. But what about privacy? What does it take to create a mechanism that protects privacy, but also at the same time allows us to learn from collecting data patterns? Yes, um, also a, a great question. And uh, one that a lot of people are putting a lot of thought in uh, because privacy in general is a concern, let alone in the world of healthcare, right? So there's, there's a lot of approaches that can be taken when aggregating data for making models that are then going to be used uh, to make decisions. And I think a lot of the work that, for example, uh, at Curi we're doing, um, is using only what's called the identified data, right? So we make sure that we remove any notion of identity from the data that we aggregate and then we build our machine learning model from. And there's a lot of interesting approaches to doing that. In our case, again, we're using the identified data, but there's even uh, other approaches like federated learning, which allows different data sets that are disjoint to be learning from each other in a way that also differential privacy is protected. So I think all of that is really key and really important. However, I think there's always sort of like an interesting tension between um, privacy 
and the efficiency of the personalized solution that can be given to every individual, right? And I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky, particularly in the context of medical care. You need to be able to identify the person as an individual in order to sort of like give them advice or even help them. And I think that's uh, an interesting tension that needs to be solved through a concept that is slightly, it's very related to privacy, but slightly different, which is trust, right? We need to build the trust between the patient and whoever is providing that service and is gathering that data so that they trust that that data is never going to be, for example, in our case, we never sell or even share or give that data away. However, we need to know your phone number. And that's an interesting one because I, um, I wasn't even sure like, you know, why do we need to know people's phone number, right? Like, do we really need to do that? And it turns out that we've already saved some people's lives because we had their phone numbers. For example, we've had some patients that connected with us that had mm, some suicidal uh, attempts. And we, the only way we had of sending somebody to them was calling the police and telling them, hey, this is the phone number of this person. And they were able to reach them, right? So being able to identify and connect with the person turns out that in the case of healthcare in this situation becomes important. Now we need to make sure that, the, and we need to um, make you trust that the phone number that you're giving us is only going to be used for this situation, right? A kind of life and death, uh, very extreme situations. And that's something that needs to be built into every system. And that's a combination of very strict privacy uh, policies and approaches to dealing with the data plus security, right? I think another thing that people are worried about is like, what if this data is leaked? What if you a hacker gets into your system and gets all my data? We need to make sure that we uh, have sort of like high security approaches and uh, strict privacy norms that uh, gives the patients trust and um, ensure them that we're, we're doing the right thing with the data. There's a, there's a lot more things here uh, that I could talk about and there's uh, even laws and regulations around protection of data that are really good and really interesting, but I think it all boils down to ensuring privacy and security and building trust with the patient that the data is only gonna be used in their benefit and for them, not against them. That's a really great answer. Um, earlier, you also mentioned in your response about federated learning, um, which I definitely think our listeners to go research, but generally I, in my perspective, I think federated learning is that machine learning approach, which kind of protects personal information by I'd say decoupling user provided data and then the machine learning model. Um, so I think that's definitely a perfect example of how AI and privacy go hand in hand, but also how it would prevent people from losing their personal information because of AI and machine learning. Um, you also talked about the importance of trust between a consumer of healthcare services, which is a great transition to our next question, which is how is CureAI working on currently in response to COVID? Yes. So, um, interestingly, when you know COVID hit, we were in the middle of building our um, system and our service and our machine learning models, and this was a completely new situation, right? So we had to basically improvise and say, okay, well, this is a good test for everything we're doing and for our approaches. The, the interesting thing about COVID or any such situation is that there's very little data, right? So the data does not exist because everything is new. And uh, the models that you had from before are not valid anymore because you need to relearn them somehow. So in other words, for example, the symptoms that you had in the past for flu are very similar than the ones you have for COVID, right? And how do you tell them apart? And how do you even build that into your decision-making? 
And even that is hard for doctors to do, right? Because they're in the same situation. Like, okay, nobody has still published anything about COVID and how do we tell if this person has the flu or has COVID? And early on, there were not even very uh, good testing that we could do to tell those two apart. So the, the, the way we approach this is uh, by basically um, having an incremental approach to improving our models. And we use uh, an approach that combines data, data that is generated and it's noisy, but it keeps improving over time with uh, what we call expert knowledge. Um, so we can use the expertise of hundreds of years of medical research to generate some of our models. And then we combine it with the latest data that is available. And in this particular case for COVID, it was available as we were, you know, day by day, week by week, we were improving and generating more data. That was combined with the other expert knowledge that we had from years of research and retrain our models to become more and more uh, efficient over time. And we could do that, interestingly, and we, we published some publications and papers around that um, and adapt our models without losing accuracy in our previous um, diagnosis from previous diseases. So that was an um, interesting finding, one that we uh, obviously had designed our approach to be able to do, but we never thought we would face a situation where like so quickly we would need to adapt and be flexible and relearn and retrain our models uh, this way. So that was uh, something we worked on. We also worked during the early days of COVID, particularly there was a lot of misinformation and a lot of need for people to access questions and answers around COVID. And uh, the one of the interesting things about that is people didn't even know how to formulate the questions they had. And there were hundreds of places around the internet where there were questions and answers and FAQs around COVID. And we integrated all of those and built sort of a, uh, an integrated natural language approach to answering those questions. We used um, a number of sort of like recent advances in natural language pro processing, like language models and transfer learning to learn how users were asking those questions and to direct them to the best answer to their question in a way that they could formulate it in a, again, natural language way, not by having to browse through hundreds of FAQs and saying, oh, this is my question, right? So that's another example. We at QRI are in the intersection of medical um, diagnosis and treatment modeling, and also a lot of language understanding and language processing for healthcare because a lot of the, interestingly, what you learn, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I work with a lot of doctors and physicians now. And a lot, uh, what you learn is that a lot of the healthcare decision in medicine gets executed through language, right? There's questions from the patients to the doctors. There's the patient telling you, where does it hurt? Why does it happen? And there's a lot of conversational data around that. So very early on, we jumped on sort of like the uh, language aspect of medicine and also the diagnosis and treatment. Um, that's a really great, great point. Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned earlier that your machine learning model on COVID diagnoses was still accurate after introducing the COVID data. Um, what do you think are the risks to adding new data, such as COVID data, to an already active machine learning model? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a good question. Uh, as I mentioned, there's um, a lot of approaches that don't deal well with that, and it is something that needs to be introduced in the modeling of your original model. To just to get started with, right? There's this notion of out of band prediction in machine learning, 
which is like, what happens when you show your model something that is different, a different class on which the model has not been trained on? How does it react? Does it completely uh, go off the rails and say something that doesn't make any sense? Is it able to say, hey, I don't, I don't know, I've never seen this class, I don't know what you're talking about, and at least tell you there's a risk? And I think that's something that is really important in the case of healthcare. Uh, machine learning models need to, one, be able to add new data and to, be, uh, to identify new um, trends in the data and new classes, but they also need to be able to react to things they haven't seen and say, hey, sorry, I cannot make a decision here because this seems very different from what I've seen before. So it's a combination of both things. In the case of COVID, it was tricky because it was a new thing that models had not seen, but it was very similar to other things that existed, right? Particularly, as I said before, things like the flu or other viruses, right? So we had to be careful on how to introduce this new data points with as much clarity as possible to make that distinction and to draw the distinction between um, bo both classes. What, one of the important things that maybe we'll get into in a question, uh, in, a, in the next question or, or in our conversation is the fact that in our case, machine learning and AI is a component of our system, but we always have doctors in the loop and that enables the model to say, hey, I don't know enough, or this is what I think, but here you go, mm, you know, doctor, you have to make the final call. Here's what I think. As the AI, I'm giving you this information, now you take it from here. And I think that's very key and very important because we're not at the point yet where we can just leave the AI on its own and say, okay, you're gonna make a good decision and you're gonna take it to the finish line. The AI, can reason and, and build a lot of good decision making. And in fact, in our data and our experiments, um, our diagnosis accuracy is better than the average physician. However, even with that, we would not leave the AI on its own to do its thing. We want it to be coupled with humans and with experts that are pairing with the AI and making sure that it's doing the right thing. Yeah, it's so cool that you just mentioned that because our next question is actually focused on asking, we know Curai is advocating an approach known as AI with experts in the loop. Um, so just building off what you were just saying, is the use of AI limited to using a chatbot to collect basic information from patients but uh, before they see a real doctor or is AI involved deeply in diagnosing diseases and what will the future look like? Yes, great question. And as I was saying before, this is a key aspect of what we're doing, right? And no, the AI is not only a chatbot that is gathering information from the patient. We talk about our AI as another member of the medical team. So we have different members of the medical team. We have um, doctors, we have medical assistants, we have clinical associates, and we have the AI in the middle of all of that. And the AI sometimes will talk to the patient and extract information as you're saying, and ask questions and gather information uh, about like some of the symptoms and some of the findings around the patient. Um, however, it will also build its own hypothesis and differential diagnosis. And then it will help the doctors take it from there. It will provide information about saying, hey, I've talked to Clarice, and I think that they might have this particular condition, but there's three other things that they could have. Now, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna ask this question or do you wanna ask this other question? So they will also, for example, enhance and augment the doctors by giving them not only potential diagnosis and conditions, but also suggesting questions that could be interesting to ask as a next step. And for example, if the doctor says, you know what? I really want to rule out COVID in this case. What is a good question I could ask? Well, the AI will say, well, to rule out COVID, these are the two or three questions that I would suggest. And then that is again, sort of like acting as somebody who's helping the doctor throughout the whole um, medical process. 
all the way to the treatment and the uh, treatment plan and all of that. So it is, a, again, we consider the AI another member of the team rather than just a chatbot or just a tool that it is used in some specific um, part of the process. Yeah, that's definitely really interesting. Um, so for the next question, I know you touched on this a bit before, but um, in regards to Curie, how can you ensure that like patients are able to highlight like their needs through a computer? And like, how do you make sure the AI doctor knows when they don't have enough information? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, great question. We, we did mm, talk a, a little bit about, you know, this notion of the AI models that mm, know what they don't know, right? This mm, out of band uh, notion. And that's really, really important. But I think uh, to answer your question, there's a, there's, there's a few things, right? One is patients don't speak medical language, right? They're very different from doctors. Doctors have a lot of very technical terms and most patients don't understand or don't use themselves. Um, so we need to build AI that when we say understands medicine and understands medical language, it understands both the doctor language, but also the patient language, right? So for example, we, we have a, an example that is uh, very simple to understand, but it's like uh, a medical concept like abdominal pain could be maybe the patient saying, I have tummy ache and tummy ache needs to be understood by the AI because you know if you're a doctor, yeah, you might use abdominal pain, but you also should understand tummy ache or tummy hurts is uh, a way to say abdominal pain. And that's just an example. So the AI needs to understand the, the, the patient language. Also very importantly, as I mentioned before, it needs to be able to ask the questions in a way that the patient understands and um, leads into good information that is being surfaced. And that's, uh, that's interesting. It's very tricky to do, but it's, it's important that when the AI is asking questions to the patient, it justifies why that question is necessary and why it's important. And it's also formulates the question, again, in a way that builds trust and builds understanding for the patient. It's kind of interesting because we've done user research with uh, some of our patients or even just users that uh, we get through the AI interactions. And one of the things that we get as feedback is like, wow, this uh, AI really cares about me. And I felt like it was really understanding me. And that's really cool, right? Because that's what we want is we want the people to feel like the system, obviously the doctors and the humans will care even more but the AI also feels like it cares and is asking the right questions, and you don't feel like you're just wasting your time asking random questions or you don't even understand what they're talking about, right? So I think that's a very key aspect of the, uh, you, the patients being feeling like their needs are being captured and they're being understood, and then that there's nothing left, uh, nothing... Uh, that is out of the um, left out of the questioning or out of the the, um, the whole medical experience, because uh, even if the AI leaves something out, there's always going to be a human coming afterwards and taking over and saying, "Oh, let me actually ask another question and see how that goes," or "Let me uh, make sure that I understood uh, the right thing from the from the patient." And I think this combination of expert in the loop plus an AI that mm, is built to understand patient and doctor and cares about getting to the right mm, decision-making is super powerful because I think uh, there's a lot of experiment. I don't know if you uh, both have heard about some experiments in which uh, it is known now that AI can beat humans playing chess in most of the cases, right? However, it is also true 
that AI plus humans beats the AI. So the combination of AI plus humans is better than the AI itself. And if you extrapolate that to the world of medicine and healthcare, it's even more obvious, right? It's like, if that's the case in a closed world like chess, in an open world like medicine and patient care, where there's a lot of information that might be hidden or not there, it's pretty clear that even if the AI alone could be better than a doctor, the combination of AI plus doctor is always gonna be better. The sum is always gonna be better than the AI on its own. Yeah, thank you so much. I think you, at the end, you were just really touching on like imitative um, intelligence of AI and how still humans um, and AI would perform better than AI. And also beyond um, the like medicine and then technology aspects of what you're working on at Curai, it's also like a business model and you want to develop that um, relationship between the AI and then your customers, which we already know is which, which we've already been doing in a lot of businesses, developing rapport between humans and humans, but it's a whole nother challenge with humans and AI. So when you brought up that people found that AI was really listening and caring to the humans, I felt that was really interesting. Um, and then also moving on to our next question. Uh, I read recently that a lot of work has been done and hundreds of papers have been published about using AI to combat COVID, but none of them really produce tools that would be good enough to use in a clinical setting. Is this because AI is still not ready for real world healthcare problems or is it because the process, for example, like NDA approvals taking a long time? Um, what will the future look like and how can AI become more efficient and effective to deal with outbreaks such as COVID? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think in um, situations like COVID, we need to react really fast. And in many senses, we have, right? So the fact that we have vaccines in such a short time means like we have really um, moved extremely fast. We've had uh, the, um, the approval of uh, very experimental techniques um, like mRNA for vaccines happen uh, swiftly. So I think that's really, really good. Um, however, in the case of AI and machine learning, we still don't know exactly how to react and how to um, build things that um, react quickly to, to this kind of situation. I think it's all about um, demystifying AI and algorithms, right? like I did at the beginning and say, hey, this is not magic, it's just, mathematics and it's just a way to improve decisions and also making sure that we have the right guardrails for when things go wrong because of course things can go wrong and we need to be very careful if things go wrong in the context of medicine and they need to be um, tested and they need to be implemented in a way that if they go wrong there's somebody picking up from there and I think that's why this notion of having AI as an augmentation tool. Some people, including myself, sometimes instead of using AI as an acronym for artificial intelligence, I use it for augmented intelligence. Why? What if you know we start calling AI augmented intelligence and we say, well, it's just a tool that humans are going to use to be more intelligent, and in this case, doctors. Uh, but it's not fully replacing the doctors or fully uh, replacing the humans, we still are going to need the humans um, at some point, and they're just going to be, you know, given superpowers, just like we get superpowers through our cell phone right now. And we don't think our cell phone is magic, right? It just is a tool that we're using to do a lot more things that we were able to do a few years ago. So I think AI needs to uh, be seen in this lens and uh, needs to be um, the, the different tools that AI produces uh, need to be regulated and need to be clear and need to be uh, designed in a way that um, they are safe. And I think that's the word and they build trust not only in patients but in society as a whole. Uh, by the way, the FDA does have 
an AI framework and approval process. Uh, in fact, I, I did write in my blog about the FDA AI um, efforts, which I think is pretty interesting because it talks about a lot of the really important things on how to build AI models in healthcare and AI tools in healthcare that can bring in a lot of improvements to healthcare in general, but also need to be built with some strict sense of safety and quality to make sure that we're doing the right thing. It's, it's tricky. It's, um, I, um, I'll just leave you with another analogy here, but uh, if you think about, for example, self-driving cars and people will tell you, self-driving cars will save millions of lives, right? Because they're gonna be safer than the average driver. However, if a self-driving car kill someone, that's gonna be really, really bad. And it's gonna be in the front page of the New York Times, right? And it's already happened. So that's really bad. And we need to make sure that we have, because of that, and particularly in healthcare and medicine, we need to have those guardrails and safety in mind. But I'm extremely bullish and sure that we're gonna be saving millions of lives by using AI in healthcare and medicine in general. Yeah, thank you so much for such a detailed response. Um, I do agree. I think AI will definitely come into play in the future when protecting um, a lot of people like in similar situations. Um, finally, we have one more question relating to like our generation. So do you think this is a good time for our generation to enter the field of machine learning or is the field already too crowded because of the AI hype? Um, everything seems to become computational and I feel like I might end up working on machine learning if I choose psychology or even social science. Is this a good thing? Yeah. Um, is it a good thing? <laughs> yeah, I think it is a good thing, right? Because mm, at the end of the day, um, AI and machine learning are tools that are going to be bringing, as I said, superpowers to a lot of different people and both not or not only in the medical fields, but in other fields, like you mentioned, like maybe psychology or maybe social sciences and all of all of the other fields where you can think about. And in in a way, this is just natural evolution of things like computing and software, right? A few years ago, a lot of people thought that the only people that would be coding and doing computer code would be the engineers. And nowadays, a lot of people that do all kinds of things code, even if it's not by actually writing sort of low level code, uh, somebody who uses spreadsheet, for example, is already in a way doing code, right? They're combining cells and putting formulas in there and combining in some ways that just a few decades ago, they wouldn't have even known how to do. So I think computing software has brought up, has revolutionized a lot of different domains and different fields. And machine learning and AI is just the next step and one that is gonna be really important for all the fields. So I would recommend to anyone in your generation uh, to be, aware of it and also think about how it's going to transform their, um, whatever they choose to do, whether it's uh, being a doctor to being a writer. Um, I don't know if you all have seen some of the la latest language models like GPT-3 that are actually pretty decent at just writing fiction, right? And you're like, gosh, how is this going to change the job of a fiction writer? Well, I'm not sure it's going to change next year, but I am sure it's going to change in the next 10 years. So if you're going to be a writer, you at least should be aware of how AI could impact what you're doing in the next 10 years. Excellent. Well, 
Mr. Ramatrian, we really appreciate you coming in and speaking with us today. Um, I know I can say on behalf of me and Ashley and also our viewers that we learned so much, so much from your talk and your amazing perspective as an expert in the fields of AI and healthcare. Um, you've inspired the both of us. I'm a junior this year, Ashley is a freshman, and we're very interested in what you do um, in the healthcare realm and also machine learning and AI. Um, and we'd love to be in contact with you in the future as well. So, yeah. Mr. Amachian, thank Great. you so it much was... for joining us in this episode of the Harker Public yeah. Health Podcast. Do you want to add anything else? Mm, thank you. I just uh, appreciate the invitation and the very thoughtful questions you had for me. And I'm really inspired to see that, you know, our newer generations are coming up uh, in such a way and so smart and with such an appetite to learn and to understand and to make great things for the world. So I am really hopeful for the future. Thank you. Yeah, so thank much. you so much. It was great to have you here. I definitely learned a lot.